privilege to be here at Wednesday in the Word this mm. morning. And Lord, we lift up our brother Steve Jumper. Lord, mm. I know what it's like to lose a father. The father is our first mentor, mm. the first male figure in our life. Lord, I remember losing my dad and just what a pain that was. So I mm. know what Brother Steve is feeling this morning. But Lord, you can bear the load. Lord, I pray that you would touch this, our brother. Lord, I pray that you would just help him to navigate in these days. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, bless Brother Carson as he speaks to us this morning. Yes. Lord, I pray that you would just fill him with the Holy Spirit, touch his body. I pray, God, that we'll leave here, Lord, feeling refreshed in the Lord. Thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for all your blessings, and thank you for this first day of the rest of our lives. Mm. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And somebody pray the demon out. Thank you. Someone just did. <laughs> well, good morning, and uh, man, it is great to see all of you guys again. I, I absolutely love coming to Wednesday in the Word, and... Um, honor to be able to speak in place of Stu. He's at Hendersonville. We're praying for him. He, he sent me a note at 522 this morning. Pray for me, Brother Carson. Pray for me. Well, pray for me, Stu. You just woke me up at 522. <laughs> I, I didn't get up to go to Hendersonville, but that's how Stu is. And um, uh, as we get ready to dive in, I am going to say this. Um, when Stu asked me last week to teach, he also wanted to meet with me to go over what we're teaching today. The amount of work that Stu Epperson does to teach Wednesday in the Word, I believe will put a lot of pastors to shame. I could not believe when I sat down with him and looked at all of the notes that he had on Exodus 33. I'm like, man, you, you do some serious background. Talk about preparing. Uh, I just want y'all to know, again, we already appreciate him, but I even went to another level in my appreciation. When I show up here on Wednesday, I am going to get somebody who has been in the Word to bring me the word. And um, I also know Stu is walking through a deep valley right now. We just keep praying for him. He's missing his dad something awful. And I don't think I'm speaking out of turn and saying that. I just know he is missing his dad. And it's a it's a they prayed. I mean, it's a, it's a whole new journey right now. A new journey for you, Steve. And as you go through it, just keep him in prayer. Um, we're in Exodus, and we're going to be there a couple more weeks. And um, God has heard his people's prayer. It goes back to Exodus 2. They're crying out. Oh, this bondage. So God comes down. Calls Moses, what a calling, burning bush. And then God goes to work and he gets his people out of Egypt. He begins them on a journey to what's called the promised land. As he's taking them on this journey, he begins to now, how do we say it? Get Egypt out of his people. So he's getting them out of Egypt, that's done, cross the Red Sea. They're no longer slaves. But now they got to learn how to relate to him. Here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. They've been in a country with all these gods. He's got to get that out. And so he's going to give them ten commandments. Moses, after he has spoken it, God says, come up here, Moses. I'm going to give it to you. And last week... Forty days, Moses is up on a mountain. Uh, where's Moses? The man had gone and got lost. Well, we got to have a God. And so they make a golden calf. 
and they begin to worship an idol. After the first commandment had been given, thou shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no graven images, number two. And Stu pointed out how really every commandment got broken. And God has got people who are back living like they're in Egypt with false gods. And it is not pretty. God is upset. God is going to deal with his people. They've got to get these false gods out of their lives. We come to Exodus 33. Whoo! You know, it's one of those chapters you cannot rush. It is loaded. We're not talking about one nugget of gold. You're going to come across five or six really incredible nuggets. So we're going to read it like Stu does. Uh, we'll start at verse 1. There's 23 verses. Uh, let's read it out loud together. Uh, I, I don't mind telling you, that part's challenging me because I'd rather read silently. But here we go. Exodus 33. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give, and I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, and the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go in your midst, lest I consume you on the way. For you are a sitting people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come into the midst of them in one moment and consume you. Now therefore, take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp. And called it the tabernacle of Eden. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of Eden, which was outside the camp. So it was, whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the And each man stood in his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked on Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle of the Lord, and all the people rose and were worshipped each man in his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend, and he returned unto him. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, he said to me, Bring up his people, but you have not let me know whom I will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. And you also have grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and now I have my grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is more people. And he said, My rest is for to you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring another here. Yeah. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you with us? 
Is Christianity a religion or a relationship? Oh, you're quick, aren't you? Woo! Quick to answer. A relationship. Seriously? If somebody is following you around, do they see a religious person or a Christ follower who has a relationship? As Stu and I unpack this, this is where Stu wanted me to start. This is where he's starting today and all the other Darios with this question. Is Christianity a religion or a relationship? Because the question here, it's easy to shout relationship, but do we really have a relationship with God? One in which we are growing, developing, um, how do you back up your answer? In this passage that I just told you up front before reading it, you're going to see nuggets, not just one or two. I don't know which one you would look at right off the bat and go, wow, that was, ah. Oh. Well, the statement of statement. Moses and God talked face to face. Now that's a relationship, gentlemen. That's a relationship. I can tell you that I know Ronald Reagan. Now what's going through your mind? He was my favorite president. I've read a lot of books about him. But I never met him. And you would say, well, Mr. Carson, you don't have a relationship with Ronald Reagan. But I can tell you that I had a relationship with Dr. Jerry Falwell because we had face-to-face -face time, not only in meetings, but at ball games and at weddings. And, and, and there were times of laughter, and there were times of sharing the most serious of prayer requests with each other. I had a relationship with Dr. Jerry Falwell. I only knew about Ronald Reagan. Now, how's your relationship with God? Do you know about him? Or do you know him? Stu's question that he wanted me to put before you is, how much do we truly desire and pursue a personal relationship with God? David said, I have one thing, a passion to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Jeremiah said, Thus said the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither the mighty man in his strength. 
or the rich man in his riches, but let him that glory, glory in this that he understands and knows me. For I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, righteousness. That's Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, which on 9, 24, this will be the verse for date the word. Um, Exodus 33, 11. You got to have that one marked, guys. Moses and God talked face to face. J.I. Packer wrote a book, Knowing God, and he said, it is what we, it is what we were made for to know God. What aim should we set for ourselves in life? To know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? Knowledge of God. What is the best thing in life? Bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else? The knowledge of God. I've been through my life working on a life sentence. Something that just sums up. This is what you're about. We call it a purpose statement, a mission statement. When I was over with Salem Baptist Christian School, Kivett and myself sat down one day and What's that one sentence that captivates everything that we're about? And I said, give it to know God and to make him known. What's your one sentence? To know God and make him known. Um, as I break this down, looking at your notes, there's going to come up three kind of main points of an outline. It starts off with God's command to depart. That's verses 1 through 6. The 10 of meetings, 7 through 11. And then Moses' conversation with God, uh, Exodus 33, 12 through 23. Now, uh, God says, Moses, it's time for y'all to depart and start moving from Mount Sinai. And then verse 2. See verse 2, and I will send my angel before you. Question in your notes. Why is God sending his angel instead of himself? Jehovah, Yehovah, Yehovah, yeah. Yah, 
You pastors know this. Why don't we use it, take a stand, use his name, and elevate him to the position that he has? He wants us to call him Father by his yeah. name. Not just a generic God, one size fits all, because he's the only one. That's why I could say to a Muslim, my God is Jehovah, not Allah. My God is not Shiva yep. or whatever. But we don't say that. The name of names, is the word, the name of names, the name of names for you and for me is Father. Romans 8, 15, when you get saved, the Spirit of God comes into you and you call him of all those names, and, and there are, there are hundreds of them. Dr. Towns has written a book that's got 365 of those names. And those who know his name, Psalms 910, will trust him. So you want to know his names. Not just God. Know those different names. That's how he's revealing what he can do. But the name of names is we get to call him Father. We get to call him Father. Yes, sir. Question. Where is it that God met Moses face to face? Because it plainly states that no man can see his face. In these verses, it says. In these verses, and that gets explained. I mean, he, he's telling the best he can he's tell telling, that they were close. They were close. close enough but he's not going to be able to see the revealed face of God. And we'll get to that in a few okay, moments. I'm sorry. I yeah, that's okay. One name above all names. One name above all names is Jesus. But in our relationship with God, Ralph, Father, and then the Father has, and that's why, again, you want to study Psalms 23. You want to study Psalms 145. These are the Psalms that are revealing who God is. And, and if, if I know what my Father can do, I will trust in Him. Okay? Yes, sir. Right. Because they don't have they don't have him as father because that would mean he has to have a son. He has to, you know, yeah. so the whole religion of Islam doesn't have father. They don't have the relationship. All right. Question Why is God sending his angel? Because we gotta get there's something absolutely mind boggling taking place here. Why is he sending the angel? What just happened in verse 3? Look at verse 3. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. For I will. What? What? God, God's not going with them? Why is he sending, their, sending his angel? Yeah, look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. Caleb, why? Verse 3, are they not going? Why is he sending his angel? Now, I don't know what you've been called. But when God calls you stiff neck, you just got one of the most severest rebukes you could ever get. It's one thing to say you're in sin, you're wayward, you're wicked. But God says, my people are, what's it mean? Talk to me. What does stiff neck mean? All right, we got stubborn, hard headed, stuck in your way. Okay, everybody help me get real firm and hold your neck. I will not. 
turn. Unmovable. I thought we were supposed to be clay in the potter's hand. And God says, I want you to go here. No, no. Stiff net. Well, I'm not turning. I'm not turning. Real quickly, I run a little bit of my rabbit trail. When I take a shower, that is my time for repentance in my prayer time. I use my shower as my prayer closet for repentance, and I'm going to go from head to toe. Lord, is there anything unclean with my eyes? And he'll tell me. Cleanse my eyes. Cleanse my ears. Cleanse my mind. Cleanse my mouth. Cleanse my hands. Cleanse my feet. Cleanse my heart. And then I've been reading, and one day there came along, you need to start asking God, to forgive you for a stiff neck. So it's now it's not just eyes and ears and mouth and mind. I want my neck to be clean. I don't want to be unmovable with God. Where he leads me, I will go. Uh, follow, go. Do, do you live that way? They're not living that way. He has called them a stiff neck people, but now watch. Why does he say, I've got to send my angel? Lest I... Somebody preached a sermon one time. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Oh, that's not acceptable today. We have a consuming God. It said in Hebrews, he's a consuming fire. How serious do you take your sin? Because God takes it very serious. And he is so serious right now, he has made a decision, I'm not going to go with you so I can protect you from me. Because your sin is so grievous, I can just wipe you out. That's what's going on here in these chapters in Exodus right now. Wow, seriously. We get to Leviticus with the priesthood. Remember, he, he's got, Aaron's got a couple sons, and they're not serious with the holy things, and God killed them. We better be reverent with that which is holy. That's why he's sending his angel. Now, we find out that this was tough. The people did. They, they, they realized it. So the next question is, why did they mourn? Why did they mourn? And how did they mourn? What do you see in your notes there? When you look at verses 4 through 6. How did they respond to the bad news? And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned. And... Here's another nugget. No one put on his. Ooh, why, why is that? Verse, four, verse 5. For the Lord has said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are stiff necked people. I will come into your midst in one moment and consume you. Ooh, wow. Now therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Removing the ornaments are now showing they are repenting. I just, want, I just want to thank God for the many times that he dispatched his angels on me to be a stiff man. Mm. And hard headed. He and is he merciful. How many times have we been, that he's been so long suffering for us as a people that he does expect at some point for us to be in and follow him? What's the great verse out of Lamentations chapter 3? What, was he show, what did he show you this morning? 
They were renewed to you, lest you be consumed. Wow. And, and what's following you today? Surely goodness and mercy. Makes you want to sing of his mercy. Yes, sir. What do your ornaments represent? Your idols. Yeah, it's individualistic. I mean, so the things that you put on that proclaim who you are are removed, so you are proclaiming who God is. That's kind of the point. Now, look at verse 6. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments. So, not here, but in your shower tomorrow morning. Strip yourself of your sinfulness. You and God, God, what is it, Psalms 139, 23, God, and see if there's any wickedness. So tomorrow morning, strip, using this verse, and get those sinful things out of your life. They stripped. They got serious about their sin. And now, they don't have the ornaments. They'd already thrown a bunch of them to make a golden calf. And God says, here's the deal. When you take off that ornament, that now symbolizes, if we went this direction, okay, if I take this off, am I saying I don't have a relationship with my wife? Well, that's what it was showing, that they did not have a relationship with God. The reason he said you got to get rid of those ornaments. I'm not going to walk with you if you're not going to follow me and obey me. So it's a symbolism. He's saying you're going to look now and you're going to see my presence is not with you. Now, we go to, we, we move on to, um, huh, I, I now know what, feels like when he's up here trying to get it all done. Uh, anybody know what time it is? How am I doing on time? Nine. All right, all right. Because we, st we hadn't got to the good one yet. <laughs> doesn't matter. Three times, doesn't matter. Um, on the question of what... Uh, Got to get started. Uh, of, of what these ornaments represent, David said individual. Um... You know, your money can be one of your biggest idols. And those gold rings, gold earrings. And so one of, one of the people that Stu gives me to look at says a personal bank account or a family budget is a spiritual echocardiogram. It measures the soundness of a person's heart before God. And I've used this before. You've probably used this before. If you really want to know where a man's heart is, look at his checkbook and look at his calendar. Now look at his phone. Now look at his phone. Now look at his phone. All right. Are you broken to read like the children of Israel? that his presence is not going to be with them. What can you not live with? Oxygen? Well, as a Christian, you can't live without the presence of God. Hoover? I was just going to say, you know, that God is running out these people that he mentions out of the land that they are in because they, their sin has come to a point of no return. And so he's destroying these people, but then he's also he's showing mercy because he's decided himself to work from uh, Abraham to work through the Israelites for 
uh, that Jesus will come, his son will come through the Israelites. And so he has a promise that he has to do, but he's also showing them they're not any more special than these people who they are overcoming. In a way. What shall I say? Shall I continue in sin? The grace may abound. Hey, I'm your people. I didn't know. No, but he's going to keep his promise. Right. That's he's part of that. Yeah. All right, going to verse 7. Moses is now going to pitch his tent. Don't miss it. Where is Moses going to pitch his tent? Outside. Where's the sin in the camp? Again, it's symbolism. If you're going to have to understand, God's moving away from his people. You can lose your anointing. You know, you lose your salvation, but you can lose your anointing. And, and he said, Moses is outside. Now, as we go into the tent, what the, what's important about the tabernacle of meetings? What's important here? This is where God meets with man. Now... What's significant about the tabernacle of meetings today for you and for me? Somebody said it earlier when we were talking about it. Well, the veil's been torn, and so we don't have to go to a priest. We have direct access. We're because the, we are the, we're the children of God. Yeah. More than that, we're the tabernacle. We're the tabernacle. Where, is, where does the Holy Spirit dwell now? In the heart. Oh. In the heart. Now, where are you not supposed to take the Holy Spirit who dwells in you into places of sin. 1 Corinthians 6. Hey, you've been bought with a price. Why are you taking the Holy... Because hey, He ain't leaving your heart, but you can grieve His... You can grieve Him. You can quench Him. So you got... Now we're the tabernacle that He dwells in. Um... It is important to know this was a temporary tabernacle. This is not the official one. Why was Moses spending so much time up in the mountain? He wasn't just getting the Ten Commandments. He was getting all these instructions on how to build the tabernacle. And, and that's why you got all these chapters that gives all these specifics. I mean, it's for you guys who do construction, you understand blueprints. Well, you know, you don't create a blueprint in an hour. It takes a lot of work to make sure this thing's going to be precise. And, and when you study, and, and students will bring some things, I believe, next week on that tabernacle. I mean, God was so specific about what went with the ark and what went with the lampstand and what went with the ark. And, and he was so specific. He said there'll be only one entrance into the courtyard. Really? Just one? And there'll be only one way into the holy place. Now, I wonder why he said there's only going to be one way. Anybody want to know? I want to give you an answer on why it's only one way. He is the way. If you go with me to Israel, we'll go to a, a, a model city, and they show the build of the temple that Solomon built, and then later King Herod would come back and rebuild, and, and you see that temple. And I bring people there and said, now look at how you get in it. One way. Look at how you get into the whole one way. And I'm not apologizing. There's only one way to heaven, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I am so bold to say this. If there is people in heaven who did not come by Jesus, I don't want to be there. Because what father lets his son die, die the way he died, on top of that? When he had asked him, not once, not twice, but three times to let it pass. And his father, I can't. you got to do my will. You have to die. And when we're at the Garden of Gethsemane, we talk about that. 
Now, if there are more than one way, how could you worship a father who let his son die? But, oh, it's okay for them to come this way, and it's okay for them to come this way. There's only one way. So here's this tabernacle. It's outside. And now um, Moses is going to talk with God. Did you talk with God this morning? Did you talk with your father this morning? Is that part of your daily routine? They talk. And it says, verse 10, as a man speaks to his friend. I, I don't, I, that it, again, I use the analogy of Dr. Jerry Falwell because he was the chancellor, he was the pastor, found a more majority, this, this bigger than life man. But because I worked with him, but then because of our friendship, he knew something about me. I had his back, but I knew something about him. He had my back. And, and Dr. Falwell even came to my house for dinner one time. That's what friends do. And Mo, I, I don't, Moses got to be so close to God, it was like, who's your best friend? Who do you just... Watch, watch this. You know, really, your best friend, you can go fishing with them and not say a, whole, say a word for a whole hour, but you're still best friends. You're just you're, you're content with being in the presence of your best friend. Um, you're talking about the one way into the temple, and it's a foreshadowing. You know, in John um, chapter 17, verse 3, it says, this is eternal life that they may know, that they may know the the only true God. The only true God. And so, the, and Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father. And so you said something that, that the Lord was just pointing out to me and showed me this verse. Is, it's not about getting to heaven. That's a reward. That's a pleasure. But it's about knowing him. And so the one way into the temple is not wait till you die, and then you get into the temple. You're supposed to enter that temple and be in his presence and know him now. Oh, so it's, the eternal life is to know the Father. It's not heaven and golden streets. It's his presence. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. In our society culture today, time is very valuable. And we had the relationship during the fall of the time. Right? Oh, yeah. All right. What's so special about the face? What's so special about the face? Why did he say, I got to see God's hand? Got to see God's knee. Why did he say the face? Ralph? Okay, so that's a real differentiator between who our father is compared to uh, those other deities or whatever they are uh, that others worship. Because our father is, has formed. He has an image. He is tangible. He could be seen face to face. He's not an essence. He's not a substance. He's not some kind of cloud. He's not some kind of consciousness. Mm. He has a corporal form, spiritual water. You can see him. And that's, the big, that's what's so significant. It's sort of like Jesus when he said, Thomas, put your hand here. He wasn't an image. He wasn't a mirage. He Real. wasn't a vision. He wasn't a, some kind of psychedelic dream. He was real. What does a face reveal? It's a mirror inside. Okay. Can I use my face to cause every one of you to think right now that I am angry? Uh, do any of you have a remembrance of your father giving you the, what's the next word? The look. Oh, woo! My dad could stop me from doing something wrong with a look. And do you know, if you're close to God and you get ready to do something wrong, you should be able to see that look. 
But you know what? I don't want to disappoint, disappoint my Heavenly Father. I live to please Him. And we're so close. Again, if you're not close, right, there's some people I'm not seeing their faces right now. They might be sleeping while I'm teaching. One of, one of the lessons I learned from Jerry Falwell was always make sure the people you're speaking to are in front of you so you can see their faces. That was a good preaching lesson from him, preacher lesson. See their faces. You can see mine, I see yours. If I'm seeing God's face, I'm understanding how he's feeling. It's revealing his nature. Hoover? There are many fathers in this room. When your child first saw your face, mm. somehow that child recognized you as their father. Is what I hear. Now somebody else can speak more about that because I'm not a father. In your notes, I want to highlight <laughs> verse 11. Joshua, son of Nun, did not depart. And and gentlemen. Every one of us is supposed to be in Titus chapter 2, mentoring younger people. So who are you mentoring? Moses was mentoring Joshua. I'll quickly say to you, there are three people that need to be in every person's life. I should be able to ask you, who is your Paul? Who is your Barnabas? And who is your Timothy? All of us should have three people in our lives. This morning as I drove in, Cliff Hartley sends me a text message. He's praying for me. He's 77 years of age. He is my Paul. He is my older mentor. He's pouring into me. I have a man by the name of Steve Brooks. He is my Barnabas. He is my encourager. For a long time, that man was Bill Crawford. He's now in heaven. And then I have Timothy's. And, and Sunday, I preach for uh, Brady Rose and Amherst, and he puts on Facebook, my first mentor. And I made the statement at his church, I have no greater joy than to see my spiritual children walking in truth. And I sent him a note yesterday, hey, I need your prayer request, because I'm still pouring into my Timothy. Three people, again, nuggets of gold here. Joshua is learning how to get to know God because Moses took him to the tabernacle. Um, now, why did Moses pray for God's presence? Now, also the question is going to say, then for God's glory. But let's just deal with the presence for a moment. When Moses is there, verse 12, he starts talking to God about, you told me to bring the people up, but I don't know, you know, uh, how do we do this? Now, therefore, look at verse 13, I pray if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight cons and consider this, that this nation is, key word, key word, key word, your people. Moses is not just looking for himself here. He's praying for the people. Your people. Now, that prayer, verse 13, show me your way is exactly opposite of a stiff-necked person. I want your way. I want God's people to know your way. Why did he pray for the presence? Because what he's asking for, it, this is a sort of a uh, foreshadowing of the deliverance of the commandments, statutes, and ordinances. Show me your way. Show me your way. So this is in preparation of God giving him the tablets with the Ten Commandments. Yep. Because that shows us the way. It was relevant then. Right. It's good now. Because the heart of Moses, too, that, that conversation in uh, mm. uh, 14 and 15, that Moses really cared for the people, <laughs> just as God really cared for those people. Yeah. Well, and Moses did not want to go anywhere or do anything without the approval and blessings of God. Gentlemen, thank you for that. Verse 14, God has said, I will not go with you. 
Now look at verse 14. My presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. You know that's somewhere else, right? Who said they would give you rest? The fourth, the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. Right? But who said he would give you rest? Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are. And I will give you. Okay. How much work are you doing today to get saved? If you are, you aren't saved in my book. And you need to come to know Jesus because he took care of it all. If I could sing, we'd sing Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He paid it all. Wow. You don't have to do a thing to earn salvation. Wow. I'll go with you. I'll be with you. Yes, sir. You know, he told the people, I'm not going with you because you are stiff necked Moses proved that he was not stiff necked God says, I will go with you. We need to learn that today. Just because we're a part, i, I got to be careful about how to say this. Just because we're a part of the church doesn't mean that God is with us. We're only, God is only with those that are willing to be with him. All right. That's preaching right there. Look at verse 15, because this is what preachers say so many times. If your presence doesn't go with us, do not send us up from here. How bad do you need God? Now I'm, 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 how bad do you need God? All right. Go to John, 4, 5, John 15. Go to John 15. Jesus said, I am the vine. And then he says in verse 4, who's got it? John 15, verse 4. Verse 4. Hold on. Verse 4. Verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. Now, gentlemen, making this as practical as I can make it for you. All discipleship with me to a young man starts with John 15, 4. If you don't learn to abide, we're never going to get anywhere. It all begins with learning how to abide. And I got this from my mentor. He happened to be in town Friday, Dr. Tom Melzoni. And I said, Dr. Melzoni, and I used the word, what's the secret? Really, what's the key? And he said, oh, Dwayne, the secret, the key to ministry, it's right there in Scripture, John 15, 4, abide in me. And then he says, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So we got a great visualization, right? I am the vine, you're the branches, he abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, David, for without me you can do. I don't think most of us believe that. I think a lot of us think we can do a lot for God without him. And you're an idiot. You're a fool. Apart from him, you can do nothing. And here's the illustration. Numbers 14. Numbers 14. The spies went in. They came back. Woo! Caleb and, Jay and, and, and Joshua. Woo! We're going to go in there. The land is awesome. Amen. But ten of them said... We're grasshoppers in the land of giants. And you know what happens to grasshoppers around giants? And they spread a bad report, and God said, that's it? You're not going in. Boy, it gets serious with God, doesn't it? This generation will not go in. Now, you don't have time to turn to it, but just make a note here by verse 15. Numbers 14, verse 36 through 45. You know what they said? Oh, we messed up. We will go in. And Moses said, Hi, boys, don't do it. Verse 41, for this will not succeed. 
Do not go up, verse 42, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. There's your illustration of John 15, verse 4, Numbers 14. They tried to go in without God, and it says, But they presumed to go up on the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the Ark of the Covenant, nor the Lord, nor Moses departed the camp. And the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back. They were defeated. And when you try to do anything without God, you're going to be defeated. Abide in him. Now, verse 17. This, Moses said, God says, I will do this thing. Hey, guys, God answers prayer. Moses twice asked God to change what he was going to do. And he did. I don't understand how that works. I just know Abraham asked God. He prayed. Moses prayed here. And he's going to give to the people rest. You got a word? I got three questions if I can. Uh oh. Can you ever sully God's righteousness or Jesus' righteousness? Can you denigrate their righteousness? Can you? So just answer that yourself. Then can you sully Jesus' righteousness in you, which was imputed by God to you? Think about that. Would knowing God intimately be more likely to change your behavior than pure grit and resolve? Mm. Abiding of the word, read John 15, but another way I look at that is this. I'm the great... How much effort is a grape supposed to exert in order to appear in ripeness? Just hanging on to the vine is all it does. Same as a peach, same as any fruit. In the Old Testament, we had to expend a lot of effort, and we have a lot of good lessons from the Old Testament. But you might try abiding either way as, as that or I simply abide, plugged into that vine, trying to get as close to God as I can. I can't quite see his face, but I get as close as that's possible in this life. I feel his heart. That's what his face is about. Feel the heart of Jesus. Stay plugged into the vine and rest in his ability to live a pure life. And I believe that if you, the more intimate you become with God, the less you will sin. I could be wrong. My sons know me, they don't want to displease me. Not because of it, because I'm going to be mad at them, but because I love them. And it's a love relationship. I want to please him. Verse 18. Our time draws short. We can't miss verse 18. The prayer request or prayer request. Please show me your glory. How bad do you want to know God? How much do you want to know of him? Moses is at a place. I, I want to know your glory. Now, Caleb, what is his glory? <laughs> oh, we can say, one, I don't know. And then on the other hand, we could stay here for a month trying to dive into the depths of this meaning. What declares his glory? Somebody should know that answer right off the bat. Okay, his words, but what's the easiest thing when it comes to this declares his glory? The heavens, the heavens and the Guys, get outside at night and look at the heavens. I go out every I just want to go, wow, God. If it looks this good on the outside, what do you look like? Because you're declaring through this your glory. Um, the uh, Bible chat says, the glory of God is his divine splendor. You can just probe on that for a little bit. His sovereign power. His glory is worship and praise. We bring glory to God. And then it's revelation and presence. The glory of God is often associated with his presence. 
Ultimately, the glory of God is a reflection of his intimate worth, majesty, and perfection. It is a testimony of his, a testament of his character and his attributes, and it invites us to respond with reverence, worship, and a desire to live in accordance with his will. Um, you know, God's not dependent on anything from us, but we're dependent on God for everything. Um, we desperately need him to complete us. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Now, God says, Moses, I'm going to let you see a part of me. I'm going to let you find out about my glory. I will make my goodness pass before you. And uh, as he does this, his goodness is revealed how he is long-suffering, how he is merciful, how he is compassionate he says i will be gracious to whom i'll be gracious i will have compassion on whom i will have compassion there's this verse from nehemiah nehemiah 9 is a is a history lesson so while you read all these verses he'll put it all in one verse nehemiah 9 17 kind of sums up what's happening in chapter 32 and 33 Nehemiah 9.17 says, They refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your wonders you did among them, but they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and you did not forsake them. Put that in your notes, guys. Nehemiah 9, 17. That's our God. I am rebellious. I wish I could say I wasn't. I am stiff-necked. I refuse at times to do what God wants me to do. And yet I encounter a father who still says, I am going to give to you what you don't deserve, and I'm going to give you what you, what, I'm not going to give you what you do deserve, and I'm gonna and 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 I'm never gonna leave you, and I'm never gonna forsake you. Now he may pull back his hand of blessing, and he may pull back his hand of anointing, but he will never leave me, and he will never forsake you. So as we wrap it up, uh, Moses has asked for God to have his presence. And to have his glory. Do you have a relationship with God? Or do you just have religion? The relationship says, I want to know him. I want to be close to him. And I want to know as much as I can about him. And I'll go with my statement. If I know more about God, the more I want to make him known. Moses saw God's glory on the Mount of Transfiguration many years later. Oh, he got the... He did get in. Hey, let's stand up. Thank you for your attentiveness this morning. Um, Exodus 33 makes you want to take your shoes off. And I hope tomorrow morning your shower will never be the same. Today, Joe Todd here. Friday, he's going to be flying to Guatemala for a mission trip for 10 days. So let's pray for Joe Todd while he takes God's word, his talents, his time, and his treasures. Yeah, you got a trip. Let's bring him up front and pray afterwards. I would okay. like to do that in Thailand in November. Okay. I have a son in law who's a minister, left yesterday for Zimbabwe for a month. Taking the gospel of work. And I'm going to Ukraine November 1st. Oh, wow. Steve, close the prayer and then pray with one person. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we've learned so much today, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the examples that you give us, Lord. Lord, you do so many miracles, Lord, to draw us closer to you, Lord. You, you show us, Lord, our, our, our dirt, Lord. You show us what our minds are without you, Lord, but you keep bringing us back. Father, your love is so strong. It's hard to understand and comprehend, Lord, day after day, but Lord, you're always there. 
your word keeps us there. We thank you, Lord, for the lesson today. We apply it to our heart, Lord, not only for ourselves, Lord, but that we can share with others. Let's pray, Lord, that we would go out today and meet someone, put someone in our path, Lord, that we can touch, that we can share your word, your love, and your grace with. Father, we just want to glorify you and, and all that you give us. We thank you, Lord, so much, Lord, for your temperance, Lord, day in and day out. You show that you love, you care, and you bring us back each day. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your closeness. And again, may we take it and share it with others. Father, we love you and praise you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.